This lesson is about the superposition of waves. Superposition of waves means that there are two waves in the same place at the same time. They're overlapping, like the pink wave and the blue wave here. In this lesson, we'll talk about a few phenomena that occur when two waves are superimposed. The first phenomenon is known as interference. When two waves are superimposed, they'll interfere with each other. This means that the magnitudes of the displacements of the waves combine to form the resultant wave. Take a look at this simple example. We have this red pulse moving toward the right, and we have this blue pulse moving toward the left. Eventually, they'll get to the same place at the same time. Now, assuming this is a mechanical wave, the particles of the medium can't be in two places at the same time. So the displacement of the red pulse and the blue pulse combine to give us the resulting wave. If we call the displacement of the red pulse 1 and the displacement of the blue pulse 2, then the resulting wave, while they're superimposed, would be 3. Now after they interfere with each other, they just continue going the way they were going as if nothing ever happened. Let's take a look at a couple of real life examples of this. Here we have two pulses heading toward each other and right there they interfere with each other to cause a taller pulse. Same thing here, two pulses with positive displacement heading toward each other and when they get to the same place at the same time they will interfere with each other combining their displacements to create one large pulse and then they continue on their way. There's a slightly different way that interference can happen as well. Let's take a look at this. Here's a red pulse moving toward the right again and a blue pulse moving toward the left. And now when they get together, their displacements are in opposite directions. We still need to combine those displacements to figure out what the resulting wave will look like. So in this case, we can kind of think of the red pulse as having a displacement of like negative one and the blue pulse as having a displacement of positive two and you put those together, you get positive one. So these two pulses kind of cancel each other out a little bit. Like we saw before though, when they're done interfering, they continue moving in the direction they were originally moving with the displacements they originally had as if nothing ever happened. Let's take a look at a couple of real life examples of this. The trough on the left and the crest on the right have just about the same displacement, so when they interfere, you should expect the resultant displacement to be zero. You can see that right here. We've just observed both types of interference. The first type was called constructive interference. This is when the interfering waves have displacement in the same direction. You can see in this diagram that wave 1 and wave 2 have displacement in the same direction right here. This results in constructive interference. Think of constructive as like building something bigger and bigger. The other type of interference that we saw was destructive interference. And this is when interfering waves have displacement in opposite directions. Take a look over here. Wave 1 has displacement above the midline, wave 2 has displacement below the midline, and you can see down there where they are in superposition that they've basically canceled each other out. Let's take a look at two final examples. Here's constructive interference. And here's destructive interference. One way that we can explain whether two waves will constructively or destructively interfere is by talking about their phase difference. This is the difference in degrees of two waves of equal frequency and wavelength. Let's take a look at the sine function and use this as a reference. I use this because hopefully it's something that you're familiar with. So the sine curve kind of looks like a transverse wave. It has a crest and a trough. The crest of a sine wave happens at 90 degrees, and the trough of a sine wave happens at 270 degrees. And we're going to use these two numbers to help us understand phase difference. 
So here are two waves, and if I put them literally on top of each other, you won't be able to see that there are two. So imagine that these two waves are superimposed. They're in the exact same place at the exact same time. So just like we said a few seconds ago, crests are 90 degrees, troughs are 270 degrees. Same thing for the yellow wave. And if we look at how these line up, we'll see that the crests line up with the crests, and the troughs line up with the troughs, and so we would say that there's a phase difference of zero degrees. 90 minus 90 is zero, 270 minus 270 is zero. The result of a zero degree phase difference is maximum constructive interference. Here are those two waves again, but I've shifted them. We're going to use the same numbers though. Crests are 90 degrees, troughs are 270 degrees. If we imagine that these two waves were superimposed in the same place at the same time, we would see that troughs and crests line up this time. And so 270 minus 90 is 180. And 90 minus 270, well, it's negative 180, but it's still 180 degrees apart. And so a phase difference of 180 degrees is going to result in maximum destructive interference. There are a couple phenomena I want to introduce that can happen when two waves interfere with each other. The first is called a standing wave. This is a pattern of crests and troughs in a medium that appears to remain in one place. This is sometimes described as a stationary wave. And this occurs when two waves of identical wavelength, amplitude, and frequency are traveling in opposite directions through a medium and have become superimposed. Take a look at this animation. The red wave and the blue wave are the two identical waves. The blue wave is traveling to the right, the red wave is traveling to the left. The black wave is the standing wave. You can see there are certain points on that wave, those red dots, where maximum destructive interference is always happening. It doesn't matter what parts of the red wave and the blue wave are at those points, they always completely destructively interfere with each other. We call these places nodes. In between the nodes, the waves are experiencing varying degrees of constructive interference. Unlike the nodes, which are always maximum destructive interference, you can see that the red and blue wave fluctuate from maximum positive constructive interference to maximum negative constructive interference. This is what causes the pattern of crests and troughs. So when the red and blue wave are crests, you get a crest. When there are troughs, you get a trough. These areas in between the nodes are called antinodes. If you like making music or listening to music, standing waves are super important. When you disturb the string of a guitar or a ukulele or a violin or a cello or your vocal cords, a standing wave is created. When you blow air into a clarinet or a flute or a saxophone or a tuba or a trombone or whatever, a standing wave is created inside that instrument. When you strike the surface of a percussion instrument, a standing wave is created inside the material of that instrument. Whatever you do to play your instrument, the whole point is to change the frequency of the standing wave created to get different pitches. Pitch and frequency are the same exact thing. We can talk more about that in class. The other phenomenon that occurs, and this also relates to music, is called beats. Beats are the alternating loudness and softness of a sound wave due to the interference that's happening. Here's an example. The loud part is caused by constructive interference and the soft part, the quiet part, is caused by destructive interference. Here's a visual example. This green wave and this pink wave look pretty similar, but if we overlap them, we can see that their wavelengths, their frequencies, are slightly different. At these places, the two waves would interfere constructively, causing the louder part of the sound. At these places, the waves would interfere destructively, causing the quieter part of the sound. There's a very simple equation that goes along with beats, and that is the equation to figure out the beat frequency, how many times per second the sound fluctuates from loud to quiet. 
And here it is. The frequency of the beat is simply the absolute value of the difference between the frequency of the two waves. So for instance, if we had one wave that had a frequency of 220 hertz and another wave that had a frequency of 223 hertz, the frequency of the beat would be 3 hertz. That means three times every second we would hear the sound fluctuate between loud and quiet. Listen. That audio clip was five seconds long. If the beat frequency is three hertz, how many times should you hear the sound fluctuate from loud to quiet? Go back and listen again. Let's look at another example. We'll start with the same 220 hertz frequency, but now we'll combine that with a 240 hertz frequency. This means that the beat frequency is going to be 20 hertz, 20 times every second. It should fluctuate between loud and quiet. This is going to be hard to hear and probably impossible to count. I think you can still tell that it's fluctuating between loud and quiet. One final example. Again, the 220 hertz. Now let's combine that with 440 hertz. For the musicians out there, these two frequencies are an octave apart. When you double the frequency, you go up an octave. Anyway, the beat frequency here would be 220 hertz. This probably won't sound like a fluctuation between loud and quiet. It'll kind of just sound like one continuous noise 